Our teaching text this morning comes from Matthew 6, 1 through 18. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you, give to, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray... You must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do. For they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you that we get this opportunity to come together as a congregation to hear your word be preached. I pray that you would speak through Garrison, that your words would remain, that his words would fall. Lord, I pray that in this message, if um, we are convicted by anything, Lord, that we would run to you with that, that we would not be quick to shy away from it, but we would be um, quick to give it to you, be comforted by the grace that we have received through Jesus. I pray that we would be a people um, that are quick to pray, um, quick to pray in secret with you, Lord, that we would not be uh, afraid of of you and what what you might have to bring to our hearts, Lord, but that we would be a, a people that are quick to prayer, quick to running to you with whatever it is that we are struggling with or that we um, are praying for in our lives, God. So I thank you again for this time that we have, and bless it in your holy name, Amen. Thanks, you Y'all can have a seat. Good to be with you all. If we haven't met before, my name's Garrison. I'm, I'm one of our pastors. Um, if you got a Bible, uh, go to Matthew 6, what Sebastian just read for us. If you're new with us, uh, we uh, have been hanging out in the, the Gospel of Matthew. We'll be working through it uh, for the next little bit. We've been moving very slowly, but intentionally through it. We'll get there in just a little bit. Um, my freshman year, of college, I was brand new to the faith, and I hopped in uh, with a ministry. I'm going to move this because I can't see the people over here at all. Hey, guys. Um, I hopped in with a ministry called Young Life, and some of you have probably heard of Young Life. Uh, it's a ministry that works with uh, high school students and, and sometimes middle school students. And I, and I started leading in this ministry, and after a couple months of doing it, of going to the high school, I met a guy named Alan. And over the next six months, I spent a ton of time with, with Alan and his friends, and we were talking about life, uh, hanging out a lot, talking about Jesus. And I was praying constantly that Alan would come to know 
Jesus. Now, the thing that you need to know about Young Life is they put a high emphasis on their camps. And honestly, for, for great reason. Their camps are amazing. They're, they're super fun. And uh, they, they put a ton of emphasis on it, partly because the idea is if, if you can get some kids to come to camp, they're away from distractions, much more open to the gospel. So I get Alan and all of his friends to come to camp, and something happened. This was the first time as a Christian I experienced praise for doing things for God from other people. So the staff and all of the other leaders were like, Garrison, look at how many kids you're bringing to camp. This is amazing. Look at Garrison's ministry. This is so awesome. And I was like, you're right, it is awesome. I, I, I like this, but like, it's all about God. And so we get to camp, and I'm thinking, this is going to be the weekend where Alan comes to know Jesus. I'm convinced it's finally going to click. I've been praying for this. I'm going to finally share the gospel for real with him, and it's going to click. Now, if you didn't grow up in the church, uh, there's this poorly kept secret about uh, Christian youth camps called Cry Night. Uh, it's, it's where uh, usually very emotional things, sin, brokenness, are emphasized. It gets very emotional. It's a lot of fun. So we get to Cry Night, and I'm like, this is it. The moment has come. Me and Al are going to talk after cry night, and he's going to come to know Jesus. Well, cry night comes, and afterwards, I cannot find Alan. He is nowhere to be seen. And I'm like, no, we missed it. It's not going to happen now. And so we get back to the cabin, and probably after 30 minutes to an hour or so, in comes Alan. And I'm like, what are you doing? And he's got this big grin on his face, and he comes up and gives me a huge hug. He's like, Garrison, you never believe it. I believe in Jesus now. I'm like, how? I, I wasn't there. And he's like, yeah, and I'm super confused. And then in comes in my, my co-leader, David. And David is like, guess what, man? After cry night, me and Alan spent an hour talking about Jesus. And I shared the gospel with him. And we prayed. And he's a Christian now. And I am embarrassed to say this, but I was mad about this. I was like, what do you mean? I felt like the conversation was stolen from me. And the next day, David, uh, we're together with all those same leaders and staff who were praising me. And guess who's getting praised now? David. And I spent the rest of the trip not happy, but sulking, completely missing the joy of Alan's salvation, who, by the way, is still following Jesus over 10 years later. It's a story that I'm ashamed to tell. Maybe you can relate. Maybe you're like, no, I cannot relate. <laughs> no. It's a story about me as a, as a, as a Christian, as a, as a leader, as a believer, doing the right things for the completely wrong reason, and the wrong motive. Instead of just wanting to help these high schoolers and Alan come to know Jesus, I just wanted to actually be seen as the guy that helped Alan and these other kids come to know Jesus. And that's a very different thing. And that's what today's passage is actually concerned about. It's a passage about the dangers of doing good things and the right things for the wrong reason. So we're going to take a look at the first 18 verses of Matthew 6. That's roughly 10 times the amount that we have been averaging uh, in Matthew. And we're going to see that Jesus really has this one key idea that kind of aligns with I just said. Now, up front... I'm going to be hopping around a bit more than we normally do uh, with a given passage. And that's, that's in part because we've actually studied Matthew 6 and its themes a good bit. We've done an entire series on Matthew 6 with the Lord's Prayer last summer. We've done two teaching series on, on giving and generosity. And we're actually going to be doing a, a whole series on, uh, on fasting during Lent uh, this coming spring. So we're not going to focus on the entire text. Instead, we're going to look at this one big idea and sort of hop around a little bit. So I would highly recommend having a Bible in front of you so that you can track along with me as I'm sort of bouncing around. So let's do it. Let's hop in. We're going to see the big idea right up front in verse 1 of Matthew 6. Jesus says, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. So he says, beware of practicing your righteousness before others in order to be seen by them. Now, there, there's a lot there. Let's just start with what does it mean to practice your righteousness? 
Well, if you remember just a few weeks ago, this has been a big theme in the Sermon on the Mount. We define righteousness as whole person behavior that accords with God's nature, God's will, and his coming kingdom. So the righteousness that Jesus is referring to here and throughout the Sermon on the Mount isn't salvific righteousness. The righteousness that we as Christians have been bestowed through faith, by grace, through, through Jesus. Righteousness instead, as Jesus is talking about here, is an all of life in line with God's standard. The heart and deeds align with God's will and design. So what that means is this is a fairly all-encompassing term. But he does mention a few things that Sebastian just read for us. There's three examples specifically here. He talks about giving to the poor, prayer, and fasting. However, we know based off of his other many other teachings that you could fit a lot of other things into the category of righteousness. Things like reading the scriptures, practicing the Sabbath, spiritual disciplines, feasting, uh, silence and solitude, attending weekly gatherings, what you're doing right now, relationally investing in the people of God, even mission and justice and, and mercy and evangelism, all of that stuff could be included in practicing your righteousness, which also means that it's included in Jesus's warning here. Jesus says, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people that you may be seen by them. Now, that being said, I think we got two really important clarifications that we got to deal with. First, Jesus does not say and is not saying, beware of practicing your righteousness. That's not what he's saying here. He doesn't stop at righteousness. He doesn't emphasize that the practice is the problem. That's not what he's saying here, nor would he even consider saying something like that. If you remember how he set up the whole Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is clear that righteousness, although it be a a greater righteousness, is actually required for life in the kingdom. And in these 18 verses, he's going to consistently say, when you practice, when you pray, when you give, when you fast, So there's an assumption from Jesus that you're going to be practicing righteousness if you are one of his disciples. So practicing righteousness is not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing to do, which I think is really important to say. It might sound silly, but I think a lot of us are really afraid of the boogeyman of legalism. And I think this can sort of become like a thing where we're like, I got to be careful about practicing righteousness i got to be careful about doing good deeds. Righteousness in many Christian circles becomes something that we're sort of skeptical of. We're on the lookout for rather than something to pursue. But that's not what Jesus is talking about at all. This is not a passage about legalism. We're, We're called as disciples to actually do things, to practice righteousness. He is not saying and would never say, beware of practicing righteousness. That's the first clarification. Second one is he's also not saying, beware of practicing your righteousness before others. He's not saying that doing these things in public is the issue. And you might say, are you sure? It sort of feels like it. And I am. Because look at Jesus' own life. You can pray in front of people. After all, Jesus does very often. He does so specifically in Matthew 26. You can read the Bible in front of other people. After all, Jesus himself does it in Luke 4. You can let people know that you're fasting. The early church did communal fasts all the time that we see throughout the book of Acts. Jesus himself lets people know that he's doing spiritual disciplines, that he's alone and praying very often throughout the gospels. And there's a reason for this. I mean, Think just back uh, one chapter, what, what Dan preached about on, on chapter 5 and verse 16. I'll, I'll read this verse to you. It says, in the same way, let your light shine before others. Why? So they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. It's not the public. That's the issue. In fact, he's implying that doing it in public is good so that people can come to know who God is. He's not saying... And would never say, beware of practicing your righteousness before others is the problem. The problem is not doing it in front of other people. It's deeper than that. His concern is not with doing righteousness or where we do righteousness or who we do it in front of, but why. But why we're practicing righteousness. Read read the verse again. I'll show you what I mean. 
He says, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. In order to be seen by them. The phrase to be seen is the critical piece here because it reveals what the intent is. The intention of your heart is actually, I'm just trying to appear to be righteous so that other people can see me. I'm doing it for the eyes of other people rather than the eyes of God. And Jesus says why people do this. Look at, look at verse 2. He says, Thus when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Verse 5, he says the same thing. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. And again in verse 16, and when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that they may be seen by others. See, that's what the problem is. It's not the practice. It's not where you do it. It's not seeking to be righteous, but performative righteousness. Doing it to, to be noticed you're doing it for the praise. You're doing it for the attention. And did you catch what Jesus calls these people? Look, look back at those same verses. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the who? The hypocrites do. Verse 5, when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites. I want you to notice he's not calling out legalism. He's not saying don't be a legalist. He's saying you're a hypocrite. That's what you are when you practice your righteousness before others. I think you get a really fascinating uh, picture of what Jesus is trying to, to show us when you look at uh, the Greek in this passage. So if you look back at, at verse 1, the, the word uh, that's translated as to be seen is the word theonathi. It's where we get the word theater. He's implying it's all a play when you're doing this. When you're trying to be seen, it's like you're putting on a show for someone. When you're trying to be noticed, you're trying to get the applause as if you were just up here acting. And then the word hypocrite is actually tied to this same thing. Uh, at the time, hypocrite wasn't an insult. You could actually argue that, that Jesus was one of the first documented people to use hypocrite as an insult. It was another word tied to the theater. Uh, a hypocrite was someone, you've probably seen this in ancient portrayals, of like those actors who had the masks on. That's what a hypocrite was. It's somebody who was in a play wearing a mask. So in other words, Jesus is saying become, beware of being a fake, of being an actor, of putting on a show for people, saying watch out for when you participate in what we could call a theatrical righteousness. It's like you're, you're putting on a theater show. You become an actor wearing a mask instead of a disciple. So instead of praying to experience intimacy with your father, you're you're an actor. You're putting on a show to try to make others think that you're really contemplative. Instead of fasting to beg God to bring his kingdom on earth, you're putting on a show to make others think that you're really spiritual or mature and self-controlled. Instead of giving to the needy and being the hands and feet of, of Jesus, you're just trying to get others. You're trying to put on a show to make others think that you're really self-sacrificial and kind and caring. Now, Jesus mentions only these three avenues, but there's plenty of other ways that this theatrical righteousness could show up. I mean, think about just the list that I mentioned earlier. All the, the Bible reading, the prayer, fasting, serving, encouraging others. I, I think a, if you're thinking about this, I think a great diagnostic question for this is, is there any disconnect in, in my life between how I treat these things publicly versus privately? I mean, would people... Uh, would people be surprised with how you treat these things? If someone, would, if someone followed you around 24-7, would they be confused by your life? Like, wow, they, they, they show up at community group and they love talking about the Bible and they're quoting scripture and talking theology, but throughout the week it's something's coming up, maybe 10 minutes here, there. They don't, they're not really consistently reading the Bible at all. Or the people that view you as a, as a person of passionate prayer and asking for the things of God to come on earth, would, would they be confused if they saw your actual prayer life? Or the people that uh, see you as servant-hearted, would they be confused by how you treat people 
throughout the week. I think this applies just as much to uh, the mercy and social justice side of this too, with all the issues going on in our world and in our country and, and even our city and state. What's the default response a lot of the time? I'm going to post about it on social media. And I'm going to advocate it and publicly by showing you what this is by posting about it. And there's nothing wrong about that. But would the people that see your posts be confused if they saw how much time and money and effort you actually put into those things when nobody was seeing your posts? Would they be confused and would they spot a difference between what you advocate for publicly versus the things that you actually stand up for and things that you're actually doing in real life? Now, I think for a lot of us, this, this is kind of like ringing the bell. Like we're, this is convicting. We're caught up in the performance. Like we're like, yeah, I, I sort of do this. Like I do pray a certain way sometimes when, when there's other people present versus when I'm alone. I do talk about the Bible in a certain way or, or uh, serve in a certain way. But for others of us, we're kind of like, I don't do that. And I actually really try to avoid doing that. And before you think you're safe, I actually think what that is, is it's just doing the same thing, but in the inverse. And, and here's what I mean. Some of us think things like, I don't want to pray in front of others because they might try to think, or they're going to think that I'm trying to be really spiritual or something. They're going to think that I'm trying to be really performative. Or I don't want to lift my hands in worship and be passionate and make a scene because people will just think I'm trying to impress them or be something that I'm not. Or maybe I don't want to answer the questions at community group because if I do and quote scripture, people are going to think that I'm a know-it-all. So we don't do any of those things. I want you to know it's the same thing, just in the inverse. Because what's the motivation? What other people think about me. It's all about what do they think about? I don't want them to think this way, so I'm not going to do it. Instead of, what does God want me to do? What's God call me to do? That's what I want to do. So we may think, oh, I hear this. So the solution is I got to stop doing these things. But that's not what Jesus is saying. And that's not what the solution is. The solution is to make sure that our private commitment matches our public commitment. That's what the solution is. The solution is to make sure the righteous deeds flow from a righteous heart rather than from a mask. Whether it be from fear or desire for the approval. Righteousness that flows from the already earned or and given approval of Jesus, not for the approval of other people. And Jesus says, hey, there's, there's actually real stakes here. He says, if you don't figure this out, you're in real danger. Look back at these same verses. This is verse 2. Again, I'll skip to the, to, to the back half of it. It says, that they may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward says the same thing in verse 5. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. And in verse 16 again, truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. I think this is really interesting. So Jesus says, here's the problem with doing good things to be seen by them, uh, by others. That's all you get. That's all there is. The only win is that somebody saw you. And that little affirmation boost that you get, and we all love it, that's all there is. Now, to be sure, that's a great feeling. And Jesus himself, look at his words, he says, he acknowledges, that's a reward. Sure. But is it a good reward? Is it a worthy reward? I mean, for those of us that, that chase approval and really worry about what other people think, how much effort are we actually putting into that? How much time do we spend thinking about it? Some of us have put uh, and, and really lived our entire lives just wanting people to say, good job, you did well, or just that one specific person. And maybe you get it. Maybe you get the pat on the back. Maybe you get the good job from that person you've been trying so hard to impress. But then, was it enough? We both know it wasn't. Like, this has my been too. And I know for you and I, the truth is, we, there's never, this has never happened before. You have never gotten that praise, whoever it is, and thought, you know, now that they have praised me, I think I will never need praise from another human being again. 
It's never happened because you always need more. That's what Jesus' point is here. Look at his warning. He's not threatening them. He, you, could, you could say he's not even that relatively harsh about this or severe. He just says, hey, if your life is all about the approval of others, that's all you're going to get. That's all there is. So in other words, how does it feel? Did it work? No, it never will. doesn't matter the type of thing you're doing to appear righteous before others. It will never be enough. doesn't matter how many people think you're spiritually mature. You will never have enough people think that. You will never have enough people think you're really prayerful and contemplative. It just is not enough. Jesus' point is if you live for other people's approval, you will die wondering if you have enough. Is that all there is? Because you've lived for the wrong reward. Now, that's Jesus' point and warning. But because he says that, according to that same premise, it actually means that there must be a better way, a way that doesn't feed off of the approval of others. That isn't theatrical or flashy. So let's look back at the passage. Let's see what Jesus actually offers. This is verse 3. He says, But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Verse 6, But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who's in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. In verse 17, But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. So Jesus says, don't stop seeking to be righteous. Don't hide completely. He's more so saying, hey, don't seek to be righteous before other people. You got to start doing the opposite. You got to do it for a different audience. Don't seek theatrical righteousness. And he actually gives a fairly simple method, right? He says, stop doing it the way that you're doing it. Do it differently. That's the only way to fight against it. You have to starve it out. And he gives very clear instructions on how to do it. Start doing these things in secret. Not necessarily away from everyone, but in the secret place where the audience is different, where you're not doing it for everybody else, but you're doing it for God. That's his solution to our performance problem. It's to change the audience. What really ought to motivate us is not, not the notice of others, but the notice of God. And he actually goes as far to say, do not even let your left hand know what your right is doing. Almost as if it's so secret, you don't even know that you're doing. Like it's unconscious. And this might seem really confusing, but I feel like I got a, a good story that demonstrates this. So years ago, when I first started doing college ministry, um, we, we started working with this, this guy who had actually retired and started working for the church for free. Um, just because he had such high level leadership uh, experience. So he's helping us build some systems for a new ministry plan. His name was Steve. And unfortunately, right as we started meeting, um, Steve passed away unexpectedly. Um, and he, he wasn't that old either. It was very shocking. He was, I think he was only in his late 50s. Um, now, I knew Steve by reputation, and I'd spent a little bit of time with him and kind of felt this. I knew that he was extremely godly and very generous, but I never knew the extent until his funeral and, uh, and in the months following because of how many stories just came out about the things that he was doing. It was amazing. Um, one of these stories stuck out to me. A, a mentor of mine named Adam told this story that when Adam, uh, right after his second kid was born. Their car broke down, and they needed like a, 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 a vehicle that would work for their whole family, and they could not find anything, and they couldn't finance anything, and the, the cheapest option they could find was a van for $19,000. And they were like, there's just no way. I don't, I don't know what we're going to do. And one morning, Steve shows up to Adam's house and knocks on the door. Adam opens up. He hands him an envelope and says, hey, Adam, I just was praying the other morning, and I just... I had the thought that life in my 30s was really hard. Uh, we, we, kids were really young. We weren't sleeping a lot. We didn't have a lot of money. And I had the thought that you're 30 and you probably could use this because I could have used it and then left. 
Adam goes inside, he opens up the envelope. It is a check for $19,000. Here's where it gets a little crazy. Years later, Adam and Steve are at dinner. And Adam leans in, there's this break in the conversation. He says, Steve, I just want to thank you for, for all those years ago, that, that check you gave us. It just, it was so incredibly helpful. It was just at the perfect time. Like, thank you so much. And apparently Steve, like sort of, like his eyes glossed over a little bit, was like, what, huh? And Adam goes, leans in and goes, no, Steve, do you hear what I'm saying? I want to say thank you for the check that you gave, the $19,000. And Steve apparently said, I hear what you're saying. I, I just don't know what you're talking about. Are you sure it was me? I don't remember. And Adam goes, of course, I would remember who gave me a check for $19,000. That doesn't happen every day. Uh, and Steve said, yeah, I just, I don't remember. But I'm glad it was helpful. Now, I think a normal response to that story is to be like, that's crazy. That, really? Like, ah, uh, no. I don't know. And I have that response too until I heard 10 to 20 people tell the same story about Steve. And there's more. Now, the point is not that you need to be rich so that you, need, so that you can give away a ton of money like Steve did. That's not what I'm trying to say here. And I also don't want you to get cynical and be like, I want $19,000. Where's the Steve in my life? That's not the point. The point is that Steve was so generous so often and for so long it was just so integrated into his life. It was like he wasn't even thinking about these things. He's just praying about it, hearing a word from the Lord, and he's going to do it. It's, it's insane. And the same can be true for us. Maybe with money, but I'm talking about with any of the righteous deeds that we're talking about here. The point is not that you need to be wealthy so you can give away a lot of money, but that practicing righteousness before God should be so ingrained in our life, it's pretty much unconscious. That's something that's flowing out of who we are. That's what I'm talking about, and that's what we're going for. And certainly that will take practice. And certainly that's going to have to deal with things like mixed motives. And me being like, well, I, I, I kind of want to do it for other people. Well, the goal is not to stop and never do anything. It's to step in faithfully and reorient our hearts and repent before the Lord and say, I'm trying to do this. And that's how God shapes us and forms us into be a person like Steve and a person like Jesus. It's doing good and right things from the secret place one thing at a time, one deed at a time, the place that only the Father sees. So I know that was a lot. I'm going I'm to start to move towards uh, closing. Don't, don't move. I, I, I got a lot to do. I just want to wrap up with sort of this one big idea. Do you see what Jesus says goes hand in hand with all of this, with doing righteousness from the secret place. Did you catch it? I'll, I'll, I'll read verse 18 again so you see it. He says that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. He will reward you. Jesus says there's a reward better reward than what you can get from performative and theatrical righteousness. Now, before you go, I don't like that idea. That feels weird. feels weird to say that God's going to reward me for doing good things. Let's just clarify. Jesus is not talking about salvation. He's not saying that God is going to reward you with salvation. The, the assumption is that he's actually talking to his disciples and to us, people who already have been saved. Right? He says, when you're praying to God, your Father. We get God as Father when we come to know Jesus, right? When we're, when we're saved by grace through faith. Salvation is not the reward. In Christ, the Father's love, His affection is secured forever. It's placed on you forever, and it is unchanging. But you cannot miss that Jesus does talk about rewards a lot in His ministry. This isn't like a, a one-time thing talks about it very often. Here's just to name a few. Matthew 25, 21, speaking in a parable here, he says, his master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much, a reward. Enter into the joy of your master. 
Matthew 16, 27, for the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Mark 9, 41, for truly I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. A few others that come to mind. Jesus mentions that there will be those who are the greatest and the least based off of how you live. Or that certain people will be entrusted with certain amounts of talents and then will be rewarded with certain amounts of talents. Not to mention all the times the New Testament writers talk about the same idea. This is a huge theme in Jesus' ministry and throughout the Bible that I think we overlook very often. But it is there. The Father is going to have rewards for us in the new heavens and the new earth. Crowns, treasures, all that. But what Jesus is saying here is that there's actually a reward available now. There's a reward available for for now, and that's actually amazing news. It's a reward that's better than the silly attention of another human being that goes away almost immediately. It's being seen by God, by your Father. Listen, we, we have to see this. We were all made to be noticed It's part of what it means to be made in the image of God. You were made to be seen. You were made to be approved of and loved and adored and delighted in. This is why the approval of others is so enticing. Because you were made with a longing to be seen. But that longing cannot be fulfilled by people. It can only be fulfilled by the eyes of God, your Father. This is how theologian Frederick Dale Bruner writes, He says it's important that believers know that their heavenly Father notices what they do. And notices not merely in a deistic way like a distant grandfather, but in a personal way, as a living Father. Disciples should know that their sacrifices are worth it. That their bucking public opinion and visibility gets a response somewhere. Human beings are made in the image of God to be noticed and to want to be noticed by God. Jesus does not give techniques for eliminating this passion to be noticed. He redirects it. That's the reward. It's the Father. It's His delight that God your Father sees you. He sees everything you do regardless of what others see. And when what you do aligns with His will, He's proud of you. When you love others, when you pursue Him, when you choose to live for His eyes, He delights in you. Somewhere along the way, I fear that many of us started to believe that God doesn't really delight in the things that we do for him. And I I think I understand where this comes from. We're very afraid of saying that my performance earns anything from God. Very afraid of the prosperity gospel. And I get all of that. But to believe that God doesn't look at what you do when you do it for him and take delight in you is a complete miss. It is to miss the whole point of what the Bible teaches about this. Um, I've, I've known for a really long time that uh, my son, Reed, anytime he, he does something new, he really wants to be seen doing it. He wants to be seen by me. He wants to be seen by Cole. And he does it the same way almost every time. Um, one of my favorite ways this plays out is, is with the trash. Throwing them in the trash. So the first time we had Reed throw away trash, we had to, to lead him to do it. And we help him, you know, take the trash, open up the lid, drop it in, and then we erupt in cheers. Good job, dude! You threw away the trash! This is amazing! And I'll never forget his face. His eyes went, oh, and he had this huge smile, and immediately goes, again? Again? More? More? And so we help him get better at it, right? And he's still not, you know, he's missing it as he's getting better at it. Like he's, he's putting it on top of the trash can lid or he's missing it completely. But either way, when he attempts to do this, we're, good job, you're doing great. And the reaction is the same. Now he's gotten to the point where we sort of just say trash and he'll take it to the trash and he'll open the lid and he'll drop it off. But every time he'll look around, try to find me or Cole, make eye contact and go, and we'll go, yeah, and he'll drop it in. And he's like, ah, high five, you're doing it. Good job, dude. Now, this is an interaction that I never get tired of. Now, here's the thing. I don't love Reed because he's good at throwing out trash. 
And Reed is not thinking, i got to throw this, what, this trash away or they're going to kick me out. <laughs> there, he's never had that thought because he's my son. That thought would never cross his mind. The point is, I delight in Reed and I'm proud of him when he does good things. I'm proud of him when he obeys me and he can see that. He can feel that and it's deeply rewarding to him. And it should be. The secret place that Jesus invites us into, you can only truly thrive there when you know you're getting a response from the Father. He is there with you, noticing you. And he is. Because if Jesus is to be believed here, every act of love toward your neighbor, every pursuit you make to know him, every discipline you do, you undertake to become like him, every step in following the way of Jesus is seen and celebrated by the Father. There's no gift you can give. There's no time you can spiritually fast. There's no act of service you can do. No sacrifice you make. No prayer you can pray. No encouragement. No word or deed that does not go uncelebrated by your Father in heaven. Do you see this reward that's available to you in Christ? As his children, it's intimacy. It's deep relationship with the Father. This is an incredible offer to be seen by the King. The cosmic King. This is... He is not an unpleasable, stoic, distant God, but a father who, when he sees his children step into what he's calling them to be and do, he's moved to joy. He's moved to happiness. He's proud of you. That's amazing. So the question becomes, will we step into the secret place? Will you step into the secret place that only he sees? He's there. Let's pray. Father, it would have been enough for you to save us in Christ, to, to justify us, to make us right with you. But not only do you erase our sin and give us Jesus' perfect record, you also invite us to follow you. And that you would see us as we do that and take delight in us. So we thank you for this gift of grace. Lord, for those of us that, that deeply struggle with this, that do want to be seen and noticed, that are very motivated by approval or are very motivated by, by fear and struggle with doing things with mixed motives, I pray that you would just relieve us of that by your spirit. Help us to see you're not asking for perfection here. That perfection was done only by Jesus and has been transferred to us. And we just get to step in and that you celebrate with us as we do so. Pray it on your